right, well, good morning, everyone. Good to have you guys. Welcome. You know, it's ironic that uh, the year 2020, everyone was talking about all this great vision we were going to have. You know, I don't know if you guys heard, you know, I even used the phrase, we're going to have 2020 vision and think about, like, the future. You know, I wear these because I don't have 2020 vision. <laughs> and um, so as our world sort of thought it could look ahead and figure out, you know, what was coming, we realized we were wrong. I think God's telling us something. And so perspective is required. And as we begin this morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 40, where we gain a bit of perspective on our lives and our life in Christ. Um, this is a Psalm of David, and the first four verses say this. It said, I waited patiently for the Lord. First off, he says, I waited patiently. Uh, how many of you guys like to be patient? <laughs> like to wait for things? Like to wait for, I mean, how many of you guys are uptight even about the current quarantine we're under? Right? Everyone, I mean, every, I can tell all you guys are... Um, dealing with that well and so we don't like to wait you know it's why so in this word patiently it's not always something that defines us well um it's the reason that you know people that are sick or in the hospital we refer to them as patients because it takes a lot of patience to get better and when you're sick or injured it takes time you know and so in that regard uh we can think about our lives and unexpected interruptions and all these things and it requires patience and, and trust in God you know and so he so whatever it was that the psalmist was dealing with it was something that he didn't like he was inconvenienced by or perhaps it was just his hope in God and he was not seeing it yet but he says that he waited patiently for the Lord he waited not impatiently but patiently and what did God do? He said, God inclined to me, and he heard my cry. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. So the psalmist says, actually David himself, says that he waited patiently for the Lord, and the Lord inclined to him. Now here's a word that we're familiar with, this word incline. Uh, what's an incline? Right? It's a slope. Generally think uphill. But so, so there's certainly this idea of incline. And so the pitch and the grade, David says that God had pitched it in his favor. So it's like, you know, it's like we were on a long hike the other day, and um, I think I was talking to Zachariah. We were talking about how, you know, it's, it's easy to complain going uphill, but as soon as you turn around, you don't complain about that hill anymore because it's in your favor. And that's what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, has pitched the grade in our favor. Um, the other way in which you can take this word incline is that God is inclined to be gracious to us. He is favorably disposed to feel uh, willing and uh, in his attitudes and actions to be disposed towards us, in mercy towards us. And he's done this primarily in Jesus Christ. And so this morning as we gather, what we realize is that God himself has called us to worship. It's not like we've come together in this room so that we might summon God, like he's off somewhere else. And we want to say, oh, God, why don't you come here? But rather God himself, the God of the universe, who is everywhere, has called us to himself, has called us to recognize who he is and to worship him for, for who he is. What David said here is that the result of these things is that God puts a song in our mouth. It's one of the reasons we sing together. I mean, how many of you guys this week got in a group and sang songs? We do the, why do we do this in church? We do it because God has given us things to sing about, things to celebrate the goodness of God. And as 
the world, the watching world sees it. He says here, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Because of what God is doing in your life and mine, believe it or not, whether you always see it or not, the world itself will see things about God. They'll come to fear him for who he is, trust him and love him and worship him even as we do. Amen? Amen. So the one that trusts in God is blessed, so the psalmist says. So let me pray for us as we get started, as we hear the voice of God calling us to worship him. Almighty God, we thank you this morning for your presence that is here, that is with us, that was here long before we even existed. Lord, we don't gather this morning to somehow summon you. Indeed, you have summoned the whole earth. And we gather here this morning as a manifestation of what you are doing in the world. You're calling broken, sinful people like us to recognize who you are and to find our joy and our satisfaction in the only place we can find it, and that is in you and in you alone. And so, Lord, this morning we hear your voice. We hear your summons. We hear your call to us that we might come and that we might worship you. And so, Lord, we do this morning, um, as we begin to sing these songs of joy, we pray you will be honored, not only in the noise, but also certainly in the truth of what you're doing in our hearts. And I pray this morning for those that are distressed or not at peace or not filled with joy or not united with you, that this morning that the joy of the Lord would be our strength and that you would so implant it in us that it would overflow to be a fountain of blessing to the people that even are around us. So Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you, my one.
sin. You may be seated. Well, we just sang about we have come to worship, right? We're here to worship God. And so for our reading this morning, I want to read responsibly through some of the prayers of worship and declarations of worship to God that we find in the book of Revelation. And because uh, one of the things you see, there's many uh, mysterious things in the book of Revelation and many things that are crystal clear. And one of the things that we see in the book of Revelation is that even now, in the very presence of Almighty God, God is being worshipped by angels and creatures that He has made and, and human beings that are already there ahead of us. And so worship is going on 24-7 in the immediate presence of God. So our songs of joy and praise just sort of tap into that. And so we want to read some of this together. If you would, please join me in reading responsibly as it is printed on the screen as well. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor and power. Worthy are you, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the land who is slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing about it, as we sing, All I have is Christ. Yeah. 
to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be. chapter 15, we're primarily honing in on verses 8 through 13 uh, with a little bit of context, so if you turn there, we will uh, read and get started. If you're following in a few Bibles, it should be on page 949, the book of Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, again this morning, as we quiet ourselves in, the, in your holy presence, we acknowledge your nearness. We thank you for your spirit that is at work in our midst, even indeed within our hearts and our minds. And even as we read and reflect upon these words of Scripture, Lord, I pray you would speak to us this morning, that you would be exalted in our lives this morning, even as our songs have ceased, our worship does not. I pray that worship will be the posture of our hearts as we read and consider and reflect upon your word and deed as we hear from you and as you address Address us. So Lord, we invite you to have your way among us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been with us, you know that we're working our way through the book of Romans. And uh, so right now we, we're sort of concluding what I began two weeks ago, primarily in as we went all the way through Romans chapter 14 and sort of tipped into Romans chapter 15. And what... What Paul is talking about, if you were here two weeks ago, uh, just a little bit of uh, um, reminder, is that what Paul was primarily talking about was those that are strong, what he called those that are strong and those that are weak, and that those that are strong have an obligation to bear with 
the failings of the weak. And in particular, what we, t we talked about this at length, kind of the broad application that that has for us in this room and in our lives. But then also, uh, specifically, what Paul's talking about is he's addressing, he's, he's talking specifically to the church in Rome, which the church in Rome was made up of Romans, like Roman citizens of all various ethnic backgrounds, and then also specifically the Jewish Christians that populated the church as well. And so you had in this scenario hyphenated Christians, right? There's Jewish Christians, maybe you call them Messianic Jews, and then there's also Roman Christians of whatever stripe. And of course, in our world at the moment, we're quite attuned to all about various hyphens, right? We have Anglo-American and Af African-American. We have uh, this type of American, that type. We have this type of Christian and that type of Christian, right? I mean, we're familiar with those labels and those hyphens. And, and currently, we're sort of embroiled in, in a lot of concern over those hyphens. And the reality is what we see in the New Testament is what matters more than the hyphen is our relationship to Jesus Christ. Because here's what happens is when you are in Jesus Christ, the primary thing that matters about you has been addressed, right? That's the thing that matters most is our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And so the amazing thing that happens is the hyphens get, to some extent, eliminated as we are united together in Jesus Christ through him, okay? Jesus Christ, this Jewish man who was both fully God and fully man, and ethnically his hyphen was Jewish, right? Okay, that's Jesus Christ as a man. And, um, and so at the end of the day, all that really matters is our proper orientation to that man, the man Jesus Christ. And so, but specifically what Paul is dealing with, the, the hyphens he's working with here in this part of the book of Romans is the Jews and the Gentiles. That is to say, the Jewish people, those of the Jewish race and faith, at least as their background, which is just, I mean, I hope we all realize the Jewish people are a people group among many, right, of the world. And so singled out by God, set apart to be priests to the world, uh, no doubt. But the reality is, at the end of the day, the Jewish people, and in the conception of the, of the sort of biblical world that the Jews lived in, it was the Jews and everybody else. And so to the rest of the world, the Jews had these really strange rules and customs, and then to the Jewish people, the rest of the world was dirty and unclean and uncouth and problematic, you know, because all the various views and idolatries, and some of which were just taboo, and some were actually real, deep-seated, uh, you know, problems. And so the Jewish people saw this, and, and so they clung to the law of Moses that was given to them to govern them as a nation. And, um, and so what we see is as the church was being populated by people from pagan backgrounds and Jewish backgrounds, by uh, other ethnicities and Jewish ethni the Jewish ethnicity, we, we have a conflict of cultures and societies and religious views, and, and even to the extent that we see it today. So even today, we ask the question, uh, among Christians, we're always talking about, well, how much of the Mosaic law should we keep? How much of the law of Moses applies to us today? And people debate that. Should we eat according to the law of Moses, or should we not? Should we celebrate the Jewish holidays or not? Like, are we obligated to that? And so on and so forth. And so those are the questions because what we see Paul dealing with primarily are the kosher food laws and also the ritual holidays that were uh, ensconced in the law of Moses. Elsewhere, Paul deals with questions of circumcision and the likes of other of the Jewish customs. And so they, these were questions that we were being asked not only of the Jewish background believers, but also of the Gentile believers. Like they want to know, I want to serve God. I want to honor God. Should we go back and and observe all the law of Moses, or the Jewish believers who are saying, perhaps they're throwing that out, and so there's all this conflict over, over how to be properly related to the law of God. 
And so, uh, so we see this playing out. And we, as we talked about two weeks ago, there are a lot of broad applications for us in our lives. But let me just read uh, the beginning of the chapter, beginning of verse 1. This is the larger context. Paul says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to simply please ourselves. So, so first off, Paul actually sides himself with the strong. He says those, there's those that are strong and those that are weak. And what he's talking about is freedom in Christ and in our understanding of that. And what we talked about two weeks ago is that I think all of us think that our opinions are the strong ones, right? Most of us don't go, I have the weaker point of view, you know? And so whoever you are, whatever your point of view is, the application is that if you think yours is the strong point of view, then you have an obligation to be patient with the other perspectives. Okay, To inconvenience yourself for the glory of God to serve and love one another. So that, that fundamentally is the point of what Paul has been talking about. Um, but another thing that's implicit in this is that he he's clear that there are some merits to various positions that are stronger than others. He says there are strong and there are those that are weak, and he identifies with the one that he counts to be the strong position. But he's saying, he's appealing. If you think you've got the strong view, then you're obligated to be patient with those that you think are weak, not to look down your nose at them, not to hold it against them, not to berate them on social media or in person, okay, but to be patient and gracious because Jesus Christ has been gracious and patient with and towards you. And that's what Paul is saying here. So he says, let each one please his neighbor for his good, serve them to build him up. Why? Because that's what we talked about earlier, because he's actually, he or she is actually your relative in Jesus Christ. No matter where they're from or what their background, or what their color or what their, <clears throat> excuse me, what their upbringing, whatever it is, is we are united in Christ. So we're literally obligated to love and serve one another because Christ has done that for us. And this is the where Paul gives Jesus as the example. He says, Christ did not please himself, but as it is written in Psalm 69, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So, so Paul is using Jesus as the example, but I just want to say this first. So hear this, because anytime the Bible talks about Jesus is our example, it's important to understand the order of things. So first and foremost, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, right? He didn't come just to be an example, like we were sort of misled and we needed a better example, okay? He, like the saying goes, Jesus didn't come to um, make bad men good, but he came to make dead men live, okay? So it's not just like, we just need better influences in our life, and Jesus is going to come and give us an example. Um, he certainly is an example, but fundamentally, Jesus Christ came because we need a Savior, right? We need someone to save us from our sin and our rebellion against God. And then as we try to figure out how do we live the Christian life and live our lives towards God, then we look at Jesus as the example, chiefly, of that. So anyway, he, he puts forth Jesus as the example. He's challenging the Roman church to be like God. He's challenging us to relate to one another like God has related to us. And therefore, he uses Jesus as the example. And here in verse 5, he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another in Christ as he has welcomed you for the glory of God. So Paul here uses a musical analogy to talk about the way in which we relate to Jesus and the way we relate to one another. Because as we've been talking about, the fundamental thing that we're to fixate and focus on is not so much whether we're called to keep all the ceremonial laws from the law of Moses, but what Paul is calling and referring to as the law of love. Because the first and chief 
And greatest commandment, Jesus said, was that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And secondly, we love our neighbor as ourselves. And he said, if you do that, if that's your bent and aim and goal, then you're going to fulfill the law of God because the truth is, that's what it's all about. It's loving God and loving one another. And as we see here, very often loving God looks like loving one another. That's sort of the horizontal, practical application of true love for God. And so that's what Paul is laboring to say. And so, but he uses a musical analogy. And quite frankly, if you've heard and seen over the years, I'm not real musically bent. So I'm going to do my best to explain. He, he uses the word harmony. He says that, uh, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. So here's the idea. So like up here, we just had a whole band playing, right? A whole choir, if you will. And everyone is tuned to the major instrument. Okay, so the piano, everyone tunes to the, you know, the, the guitar is tuned to the piano. Everyone tries to sing along. So it's like Jesus Christ is the major instrument. And so everyone has to be tuned to him. I mean, if we're not tuned to Jesus, then no one's on the same page. Okay? But as everyone is tuned to Christ, then all of our individual, uh, unique, diverse voices, or to use Paul's analogy, lives, all of those things sort of rise together as we live our lives in Christ, and they harmonize. So harmony is the simultaneous combination of individual sounds that are blended together in a way that is pleasing to the ear. And so that's just sort of the musical definition. But spiritually, we recognize that as we tune ourselves to Jesus Christ, and then we sing in harmony to one, with one another, it's not the voice of absolute unanimity. It's not like everyone is supposed to just be the same. But we're all tuned to Christ and singing the same song. And it's a song that the world hears. Like, that's part of the purpose of God in our lives. Sometimes we wonder, well, why am I still here? You know, if, if God has saved me, why didn't he just, like, take me out of the world? You know, isn't he done now? No, because he has a purpose and a plan for your life, right? If you're still breathing then there is absolute certainty that God has not finished working in and through your life. And part of it is the harmonized song of your life, along with all of the other people of God, those that are in Christ around the world. And the watching world, whether it knows it or not, whether it likes it or not, it hears this song that brings glory and honor to God, and it causes hope to rise. It causes people to sense the reality of who God is and what he's like, like we've read and talked about already in earlier verses, uh, to even fear God. I remember as a non-Christian getting around real Christians for some of the first time. I remember some of the first people, I thought, that's a real Christian. And, and over time, some of what it would create in me is like fear of God and awe of God, because I began to realize that I think there really is a God and I'm not sure that I know who he is. I'm not sure I'm rightly related to him. So there's this harmony that goes on as we're tuned to Jesus. And so that's the analogy that Paul is using here to talk about the way in which, despite all of our differences, all of our strengths and weaknesses and varying opinions, uh, the way in which we do, are called to live our lives together for the glory of God. That's why he says, for those that are strong, you have the obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. So this is sort of the big overarching context of the verse that we come to this morning. And the reality is the reason this matters, and, and, in, and in Paul's specific um, topic that he's addressing, where he's talking to Jews and to Gentiles, those from different backgrounds and and ideologies and experiences and problems. Um, the fundamental reason that this matters the most is because whether we are accepted by God or rejected by God, whether um, despite our strengths and our weaknesses, what matters is not our actual righteous deeds and acts or even our shameful ones. It 
has nothing to do with our proper upbringing or the lack thereof. It has nothing to do with our social or our ethnic backgrounds. It doesn't have, uh, it's not dependent upon who our parents are or were. It doesn't depend upon any of those things. It only depends on how we are related to Jesus Christ. And so this is Paul's point and why the idea of being in Christ is so significant. And so as he's describing these things here in this portion of the book of Romans, we come to our verse in uh, our, this morning and beginning in verse 8. Paul says, I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarch and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. There's a lot of things we see here, but just uh, first off, the very first thing we see is he says that Christ became a servant. Now, in the original Greek language, this word servant is the word diakonos, which is where we get our churchy word deacon, okay, which is what, what a deacon is, is a servant. A deacon is one who intentionally has an office of serving other people. And, um, and so we see Jesus Christ became a servant. We read about it in Psalm 2, where it says that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he didn't cling to that, but rather he chose to come to earth in the form of a human being, something that he himself had made, humanity, and he humbled himself, taking the form of a servant so that he might serve us who were in need. Jesus himself said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. Jesus, the strong, giving his life for the weak. So first off, Paul says that Jesus became a servant. Secondly, he says that Christ became a servant specifically to the circumcised. What does that mean? He's referring to the Jewish people, that Jesus Christ came uh, as a Jewish man born under the law, who, who lived a perfect, sinless life according to the law of Moses. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to what? To fulfill them, right? It's something you and I could never do. I mean, the, the law, the Mosaic law, was this massive burden by design. So Paul elsewhere would describe the law as like a, a chain with a great weight. And, and if just one of those links is broken, what happens to the weight? Falls, right? I mean, it collapses. And so that's our lives. I mean, we're like a bunch of, our life is like a chain link, and our attempts to keep the law of God is just, I mean, they're all weak, you know? All our links are weak, and some are more broken than others, and, and the weight falls. And by, des, by God's design, this is the way the Bible teaches, the New Testament in particular shines this bright light on the Mosaic Law, Mosaic law and it's very clear that it is a burden no one can bear. But the reason it was given was to help us to see our helplessness. In light of the law of God, we go, I can't do it. Amen. And the answer is what? The answer is Jesus Christ did and can, and he did it in our place. And he died to take our guilt and our shame and all these things. And he is our substitute. Yes. Because we don't just need an example we need a Savior. Amen? Amen? And so that's the point of the Mosaic Law, is to overwhelm you with your inability to please God so that you would realize that He Himself is your Savior. And that we would come to Him for His mercy. So, so the circumcised. says He became a servant to the circumcised. So Paul is speaking into this question about how we relate to the Mosaic law. And, and he says, Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. 
So he, what Paul's saying is he became a Jewish man to fulfill the law of God so that all of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be found to be true. And we go back to Genesis 12, where we can talk about other places, but where the blessings that God gave, the promises that God gave to the patriarchs, was we find first in Genesis chapter 12, where the Lord came to Abraham, and Abraham, who he and his wife were barren, they couldn't have children, and what did he say? He said, Abraham, look up. What do you see at night? All the stars, right? And he said, how many? Can you count them? No, I can't count them. Well, that's how many your children are going to be. Come from your body, you know? And, and the Bible says Abraham and Sarah, they thought their bodies were as good as dead, and they were. Okay, naturally, they were unable to fulfill what God had promised. They couldn't do it apart from what God himself did. And so he said, through your offspring, he said, I, so the Lord said, I'm going to bless you, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Paul later on points out that the word offspring is singular. It's not just all the multitudes of the children Abraham and Sarah had, but it's the one. It's sort of like the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. After the fall in the garden and the ruin of our world begun as judgment set in because Adam and Eve rebelled against God, what was the promise God made to Eve? He said, your offspring, singular, will come and crush the head of the serpent. And this is the first promise we have of the coming Savior into our world, the one who would crush the head of the serpent and undo the work of the fall. And we see that there. And then in Abraham, the Lord says, I will bless you. And through your offspring, I will bless all the nations of the world. The point Paul's making is that Jesus has come to bless the people of Israel and everybody else. And so whatever else the arguments are that they're having, Paul wants this to be crystal clear. And so the promises that the Lord made to the patriarchs are confirmed, and the mercy of God to the rest of the world is made clear through the coming of Jesus Christ. And so that's why Paul goes on, and, and he's going to be preoccupied with this more and more, here at the end of the book of Romans, but he has this litany of quotations from the Hebrew Bible that are defending this idea that God has not just come to the Jewish people, but indeed to all of humanity, that he has opened the door to reach and to save from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so he begins with a quote from King David in 2 Samuel 22, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Again, quoting Moses, Deuteronomy 32, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Again, Psalm 117, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol you, extol him. And again, in Isaiah 11, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule all the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. And so what we see here is that the primary end and aim and goal of what God is doing in the world is that Jews and Gentiles, that's to say the Jewish people and everybody else, weak and strong, young and old, male and female, slave and free, or fill in the blank, are called to Jesus Christ to be united in him in such a way that we're so tuned to him that as we live our lives for the glory of God, we're all singing in harmony and living in harmony in such a way that we're like a grand choir singing a song that is pleasing to hear if people have ears to hear it. Amen? And the ultimate message of the song that we're singing is that God is true and that God is merciful. You know, the reality is the world doesn't believe those things, those two things right there. God is true and God is merciful. The world just doesn't believe it. I remember as a non-Christian, personally, I, I thought the truth about God is ambiguous. 
Like you can't know. And, and if he's out there, he's probably more like me, shifting, changing, unreliable. And, and then we also want to believe, we, we will say God is love in our culture. But if you see, so what we do is we make God in our image, right? That's, what I, that's the heart of idolatry, is we make a God in our own image. Whereas the Bible says God has made us in his image, you know. But the reality is we make a God in our own image and, and we behave like our God. I mean, like our world right now, we call out for justice, we call out for love and all these things, and then we go burn down a building, okay? So the reality is, I know that's not, I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush because there's a complex story going on right now in our, in our country. But the reality is that the judgment we want to bring to bear on our enemies is not reflective of the kind of justice that God himself implements in the world. God is just, you know? God is holy. That's one of the reasons we need a savior. But the reality is fundamentally God himself is merciful. And he has so inconvenienced himself as the strong, reaching out to the weak. We see in Jesus making himself weak on our behalf so that he could reconcile us to himself. And the message that we have for the world is that God is true and that God is merciful. The, the message that we have, that Paul has for the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people, everybody else, the message we have for the Jewish people and for everybody else is that God is true and God is merciful. You're wrong and God is right. You're in need of mercy and God is the remedy. Amen? And so this is what Paul is laboring to explain during all this section because it fundamentally has to do not only with our understanding of God and how he relates to us, but how we are called to relate to one another. And that's the burden of what the Lord is, uh, what Paul is, is laboring and describing uh, to explain here. Um, and, and Paul concludes with this in verse 13. He says, uh, again, he's sort of reiterated, there's like this, the third time in the last chapter and a half where Paul has said something like this, he ends this section in verse 13 by saying, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in <coughs> believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Now, in American English, this word hope, it's really not a very concrete word. It sort of describes a feeling of optimism. You know, like I sort of hope I get ice cream this afternoon. Or I hope that things in my life will go better than perhaps they have so far. You know, I mean, it's a general feeling term. And, and we describe hopelessness as someone who's lost that feeling, you know. But, and so it, it can be related, but the biblical idea of hope is something that is grounded in concrete realities. It's not like in question. It's not, I hope this works out. It's, it, hope is a noun. It's a thing, you know. It's God himself, and it's his promises that are true and that are merciful. And so biblical hope, you can feel biblical hope, but you don't have to. Biblical hope doesn't always look like a feeling. Biblical hope always looks like a certainty that God is who he says he is, and that God is the way that he says he is. And he, was that confusing? Yeah. God, God, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm tired. God <laughs> is, uh, he is the way he has revealed himself to be, and he's true, he's honest about everything that he says. So anyway, um, so you may feel that from time to time, but trust in God looks like, uh, walking day by day in the light of what we know about God. And then sometimes, like the psalmist we read in the beginning, who waited patiently for the Lord, sometimes there's a delay of patience as we trust in God, and then we find his promises to be true. And so Paul is driving these things home. And in the end here is, uh, as we conclude, I just want to encourage you, I think what Paul is, would, would commend to us in light of all of these things is 
whether it's our relationship to God or our relationship to one another and the world that's around us, is perhaps you lack a sense of hope in God or hope in your relationships or maybe it's joy and peace in your heart and in your mind about your circumstances or your life or your future or your eternity. And what the Bible says is if you want to be filled with those things, then the only place to get them is by being rightly related to Jesus Christ and letting him fill you with them because he's a fountain of joy and hope and peace. It literally says here he is the God of hope. And so hope is a characteristic of God himself as it spills out into us because of the certainty of who he is and what he is like in all he's done. So I just want to invite you as we respond this morning and prepare our hearts for a time of communion to just, if you would, just close your eyes and bow your head before the Lord. And in the privacy of your own heart, I would invite you to cry out to God, to call out to this God of hope, to ask and invite him to fill you with hope and joy and peace, to fill you, to fill you with the certainty of his truth and the certainty of his mercy both for you and for the people that are around you. And to let that so season and affect you that it first begins as worship and then culminates as a lived life for the glory of God. As Paul said in chapter 12, we're called to offer our lives as a living sacrifice of continual worship. And in many ways, it looks like what Paul has been describing. So I would encourage you just to take the next few minutes and call out to the Lord in response to these things. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so as you prepare your heart for communion with Christ, as we join our hearts together, and as we celebrate the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus on our behalf, of the strong becoming weak for us, of him yielding up his life, becoming a servant to us, to serve us at our deepest need. Lord, we love your example, and we want to emulate you in the way that you have loved us. But Lord, we also so desperately need you as our Savior. <clears throat> Think about a... Uh, quote from Martin Luther that I read earlier this week. He said, when I look at myself, I don't see how I could be saved by God. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could be lost. And as we come to the Lord's table, and we have an opportunity to, to bring, just to fully expose ourselves to the Lord, to say, I'm not pretending or hiding I'm not trying to pull anything off. I am who I am, and you know me. And indeed, you have died for me because you know me better than I know myself. And as you turn over the things in your heart and your life, perhaps even this week, that would stand in the way, interfere with your relationship with God and even your relationship with other people and I would invite you and encourage you to confess that to God and to bring it into the light. To realize at the end of the day that uh, we ultimately aren't called to look at ourselves, but we're called 
to look to Jesus Christ. And so as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, we remember that his righteous life was lived for us in our place. And his suffering and death were born for us to take our place. Lord, we thank you that you lived for us, you died for us, and you have risen again. Even now, you ever live to intercede for us, to share and pour out your spirit upon us. And I pray now in this moment, Lord, as we remember the cross, that you would fill us with joy and peace in believing in the hope that is born as the fruit of that. The joy and the peace that we need as well as the hope in Christ that is fixed and immovable and not affected by this world, not affected by our weaknesses, not affected by our uncertainties, but is fixed for all time in eternity. The elements of the Lord's Supper are perhaps before you in the chairs and on the windowsills. This is sort of communion and quarantine, um, little self-contained cups and bread. It is actually bread. I read the ingredients. And uh, if you want to, you know, grab that. And um, so here, as we begin to listen to the Lord as he was celebrating and observing his last, not only his last meal, but his last Passover meal with his disciples. And the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And again, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Before we're done, before we sing our last song, I want to read together from a handful of verses, 2 Corinthians, Matthew, Philippians, and Psalms. It should be on the screen as well. And let's read this responsibly uh, before we draw to a close. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that so that you by his poverty might become rich. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Being born in the likeness of men. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting. May the name of the Lord be praised. Please stand as we sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah.
These are free to give away, so take what we've said is take one for yourself and one for somebody else. And uh, so grab those. Those are on the back table. Also, um, you know, we actually do have guest musicians this morning. And uh, so we have Thaden and all her cousins. And so thank you for joining us. And so if you haven't met these young ladies, it's Hannah, Sammy, and Michaela. And then also my son, Ethan. Yes. Yeah. Last but not least. Yeah. So thanks, guys, for leading us musically. And then the last thing I want to say, too, is, you know, uh, it's funny. You know, we come here, and this is about the only place that we sort of gather like this because the whole quarantine thing is just not over. And if you believe even the modest estimates, this is going on for quite a while, you know. And uh, whether we like that or not, or whether we agree with it or not. And so, but the world is as it is right now. And I think the reality is um, there's a lot of uh, unique stress during this time. And uh, there's strain from all different angles. And I just want to encourage you to hang in there and uh, trust in God. Be intentional about drawing near to God and about being patient with one another. Even being patient with yourself. And... Um, and so as we've talked about these things, just to think about not only God's patience with us, but also the patience that we can extend to other people in this unique time. Amen? Amen. So um, I just want to conclude with the words of 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he 
will surely do it. Amen. You may be dismissed. Thanks for coming. God bless you.